So good morning, everybody. <clears throat> we are ready to get rocking and rolling here. There's a couple things that I, I need to talk to you about today um, that we've kind of cooked up. But I, of those, there we're going to spend about 30 minutes and so on. And we're also going to have the glorious and fantastic, uh, wonderful friend of mine, Mr. Brad Ehler, talking for a little while. Uh, Brett is, uh, by the way, before we get to Brad, Brett's uh, is just one of the most successful members we've ever had. He he was our in-house trainer for a long time, and uh, he is now a trainer for uh, other companies across the United States and has just an absolute uh, tremendous success rate in terms of training people how to get houses and how to make money. And he can do that with our program with absolute ease and facility because he knows our program as well as he does anything out there. So when we, when you get to Brett, uh, we will uh, we'll learn something in a little while. Here's what I wanted to talk about early. Right now you can see my kisser on the screen. Um, and I wanted to apologize to everybody who tried to call me this week, if if anyone has, <laughs> and wasn't able to get a hold of me. I think we've had other people answering the phone, though. But I uh, ran into a bit of ill health at the beginning of the uh, of the week, and I'm just now starting to recover. It's not nothing serious, but it was painful. It's called, it's called gout, and it's just a collection of uric acid in the lower extremities, like a toe or foot or something. Mine was just one side of the foot, and it hurt like a, like a cork told me to use this word, sumbitch. Uh, hurt like a sumbitch. And it's just now starting to ease up a little bit, and I feel pretty good. Uh, so thank you for all the cards and letters. Uh, I didn't get any, by the way, but if I had, a, well, I would have been very thankful. <laughs> so let's go ahead and get started. Here's the thing that <clears throat> uh, kind of well, I guess it kind of bothers me all the time, and that is that people are not taking advantage. I hate to take off and on a negative angle. You know, these calls should be always off on a positive angle, and everything is is popping, and everything is happy, and beautiful flowers are popping out of everything, and so on. <clears throat> well, to be honest with you, it's, it's not that way. I mean, I'm happy. Uh, my income is sufficient for me to live pretty comfortably, uh, not ex ex exceptionally, but comfortably. And things are going well. But the thing is that there are too many people, many of them on the line right now, who are not having a high degree of elation in the business that they're in. And that's too bad because if you guys would just listen to me, like I try to tell my wife every day, hey, listen to me, I know what I'm talking about. <laughs> And then she slugged me one. But if you listen to what I'm saying, you guys don't have to be on the short side of the stick anymore. If you listen to some of what we talk about, you don't have to go through any more of your life without all the money you need to do everything you want to do, really. And it doesn't matter what that is. Maybe what you'd like to do is go lay out in the shade in the park every day and listen to the, the sea waves rolling or something. Or maybe what you'd like to do is take a few uh, cruises uh, here and there. There's nothing, <clears throat> absolutely nothing to stop you from that if you will stop and listen to me for a minute. So I'm going to talk to you like I would my kids, you know. So uh, uh, just listen, because it's what I have to say to you is extremely important. And it's this, guys, and we've been over it a dozen times, and some of you who've been on the call with me, uh, you know, a hundred times, maybe you've heard too much of it, I don't know, but you're not doing enough of it, so we're going to go through it again. Here's the thing. you got to think of our program as something being very, very simple that other people don't know how to do. In other words, if you go up to someone who's a real estate investor and you say to them, um, listen, um, how do you go about converting real estate and a personal estate? In other words, how do you convert the ownership of a house into the ownership of a piece of personal property? Now, notice that the difference, and if you didn't already know, you should, but the difference between personality and realty or personal estate and real estate is that one of them is owned by a king and the other is owned by a person. So the word real, as in uh, Camino Real or royalty, uh, real means king. So anything that is real estate or real estate would have been owned by a king in feudal England. 
That's so that's where the word realty comes from, the king's property. Personality, on the other hand, is the opposite of that. That would be property that a vassal could own and that the king didn't have any uh, ac access to. Okay, so there were two kinds of property, realty and personality. Well, there used to be two kinds of courts. In, in uh, New England, there were two kinds of courts. There was a, a, a court of uh, uh, equity and there was a court of uh, uh, litigation, I guess you'd say. Well, those courts are blended together. There was a court of equity that said that if you're suing for some, something other than real estate or if you're suing somebody for something other than murdering somebody or something else, then you're going to go to the court of equity. <clears throat> well, with the founding of the United States <clears throat> and the, uh, the new government, uh, the courts of, uh, of equity and the court of uh, the word I can't think of off the top of my head, but the court of suing somebody <laughs> are, are one and the same. So right now, <clears throat> the idea is if you own real estate, you're going to be subject to certain federal regulations and state regulations that pertain only to real estate. And that has to do with income tax write-off for mortgage interest and property tax and income tax write-off for this and that. It's going to have to do with how you would sue somebody in order to collect a debt if they own realty versus <clears throat> what you would do if they own personality. Now, what we want to do is, in our business, we want to have the best of both worlds. What we want to do is to say, all right. Here's a house. Now, I want the U.S. government, the federal government, to think of me in terms of owning personality, not realty. I don't want them to think of me in terms of being a real estate owner. Because if they do, then there can be liens and suits and judgments and uh, against the property. And I have to, if I'm going to finance it for somebody, I have to qualify under RESPA and TILA uh, uh, regulations and uh, uh, all of this kind of stuff. And I don't want to do that. So we'll convert it to personality. Well, what the IRS has done is they've said, okay, back in Al Capone's days, they started this thing called a land trust, which is a, an English title-holding real estate trust. <clears throat> and we were fooled by Al Capone and a lot of people who would convert their properties. Guys, my voice is failing, and I'm, I apologize for that. hope it gets better. Let me do a sip of coffee and see what happens. So what we're going to do about that <clears throat> is we're going to say to everyone who's got one of these crazy things called a land trust, you're not fooling us anymore. We're going to pass a revenue ruling in 1992. It's revenue ruling 92105 that says that if you are a beneficiary in one of these things called a title holding Illinois type um, land trust, you haven't fooled us. We're going to treat you as the owner of the real estate. For all tax purposes, even though you don't own any real estate. If you own interest in a trust or a corporation or something, that's personal estate. That's personality. But the government says, even though you own personality, if your personality is interest in one of these land trusts, we're going to treat you as if you're the owner of realty. Well, that's wonderful news. You're not going to get by with anything with the IRS, but it's wonderful news because now... What you can do is take that real estate, put it in a trust, in a land trust, and now you don't own the real estate anymore. You've given the real estate ownership to your trustee. But what's left over is your beneficial interest. And your beneficial interest is personal estate. Well, when they pass laws, <clears throat> even the Garn St. Germain Act to, to uh, prevent due on sale violations and so forth, and especially the Dodd-Frank Act designed to regulate, uh, more closely regulate seller-assisted financing or owner-carry financing, it doesn't affect personal estate. Those laws are written to, to limit and to regulate real estate. Therefore, I don't have to worry about being accused of a Dodd-Frank regulation violation if I'm not dealing in real estate. And I don't have to worry about a due-on-sale clause in a loan if I haven't gone out and, and taken a deed from somebody or given a deed to somebody who owns real estate. 
Uh, as far as Garden St. Germain is concerned, it's Title 12 of the U.S. Code, <clears throat> Paragraph 1701, and our particular section is J3. So it's 12, 1701 J3. This says if you own interest in a land trust, basically, this says trust or an estate. But if you own interest in one of these things, then you're not violating a do-on-sale clause when you sell or assign beneficial interest to somebody else, as long as you're not giving them 100% of the beneficial interest. Because the bank doesn't want its, um, its security jeopardized or impinged upon but they can't stop you from putting your property into an intervivals trust for asset protection purposes, even though they're the secured party on the loan. It doesn't stop them for foreclosing on you if you try to burn the house down or if you uh, stop making payments or something. But they can't foreclose on you merely by bringing someone into the property and giving them a beneficial interest in your trust. You need to do that anyway, because in any trust, you always want a a um a remainder agent. You gotta have somebody who takes over if you die. So you have to name a remainder agent. Now in an ordinary intervivalist family trust, the remainder agent is the is another trustee. So you say, okay, if I die, I want my wife to take over, so I'm gonna make her my co trustee. Well, in that a land trust <clears throat> is beneficiary directed and not trustee directed. Now your remainder agent has to be another beneficiary. And you've got to have one in every trust. There's no, it'd be foolish to try to set up a, an intervivalist trust without a remainder agent. What happens when you die? Everything gets lost and goes back to the state. So in a land trust, since it's beneficiary directed, your remainder agent is another beneficiary. So let's say your beneficiary is a guy named Bob. And Bob says, oh, I like that house. Can I live in it? And you say, sure you can, Bob. As a matter of fact, if you live in it and make all the payments, I'll give you, I'll let you take all of the income tax right off on the mortgage loan. And also, since you're a beneficiary in this type of trust, you can also have the income tax write off for uh, property tax. So now <clears throat> you're living in the property, so obviously you have use and occupancy. You can take the income tax right off, so you have all of the, the benefits of income tax deduction. And the contract that you have with the other beneficiary can say that at some point in the future, the house is going to be sold by both of you, and one of you will get something from the sale, and the other will get something else. So you can make it, well, Bob, you can have 90% of all the profits if you give me 100% of all of the existing equity in the property when we sell it. Or you might say to Bob, <clears throat> let's split everything 50-50 when we sell. Make it a 50-50 equity share, whatever. But the point that I want to make to you is this. What we do is simple. Don't let it get complicated in your own mind. All we do is say, <clears throat> you got a house, put it in a trust. Well, what am I going to do with it now? Well, lease it to somebody. Oh, okay. So I got a house in a trust and it's being leased to a guy named Bob. Yeah. Well, Bob would love to own it. Well, tell you what. Why don't you make Bob a beneficiary in that trust? And now he has 100% of exactly the same benefits he'd have if he was an owner of the house. Got income tax right off use. Uh, he's got occupancy. He's got protection against lawsuits. He's got every single piece of fee, simple real estate ownership. But he didn't have to come up with a down payment. And he didn't have to qualify for a loan. He can take over the payments on the existing loan and get 100% of all the benefits of any homeowner without ever having to go on title or being named in the loan. So it becomes an ideal situation for you if you want to own a house that way. Real simple. You go tell somebody who's got a house available and say, hey, let me take it. I'll take over all the payments, maintenance, repair, upkeep, property tax, and insurance. And then I'll refinance it someday and, and pay you all the equity back that you have in it today. Or you can say, I'll refinance it someday. I'll give you back all the equity you have in it today, plus 50% of any appreciation there may have been over that period of time. Now, here's what I want you to think so carefully about. Real estate investors way too often concentrate on one thing. They concentrate on what's called equity. 
if you go out to buy a house and you want to do some creative financing and you want to buy it today and sell it to somebody else tomorrow for a profit, how do you do that if the property is upside down? What if the loan on it is 200000 and the house is only worth 170 Now how are you going to buy it today and sell it to somebody else and make some profit in a week? Unless you know us, unless you know how to do what we do, you can't do it. So that's the point I try to make is this. We don't, I don't want to buy a house that's over encumbered, but if I find one that's over encumbered, I'll take it because I don't, I don't, I don't concentrate on equity as being the be all and end all. Equity is just one piece of the, the income function in, in, um, investor real estate. The other pieces are positive cash flow, equity buildup from principal reduction, future appreciation, and income tax deductions, if I didn't already say that. So what if I got a house, there's no equity in it, but it's worth $200,000. There's a loan on it of $200,000. The payments on it are $1,500 a month. But I can lease it out to somebody for $1,600 a month. If I didn't get anything else, I got $100 a month positive cash flow. Well, what if the guy who's going to lease it out, what if I can give him income tax deductions, use, occupancy, and all the benefits of ownership? Wouldn't he be willing to pay me a lot more than $1,600 a month? I mean, after all, he could pay $1,000 more and still be paying less after tax than he would be if he was just renting. Here's the thing that I, I need you to think about along the way. There's a bunch of these little pieces that fit into the puzzle. But right now, and I apologize for my voice, I feel good, look great. And uh, <coughs> my uh, joints are working, a couple of them. I, mean, I got a few of them, one, but I'm, I'm good. Here's what I want you to think about. And I've gone through this with with you guys a thousand times, too, but you you tend to forget about it. If somebody's renting for $1,000 a month and they're in a one-third tax bracket, as most of us are, 28% federal, 6% state or something, we're going to be in about a third, okay? Now, that means that if you don't own the house that you're living in and you're paying $1,000 a month, well, what you have to do is go to work and earn the $1,000, but you can't stop there. You've got to earn another 500 in order to pay the tax on the thousand that you earned. Now, this takes a little bit of thought, so don't let it throw you. I said that you're in a one-third tax bracket. So why would you be spending 50% of your rent and paying the income tax? It's because you pay tax on what you earn, not what you pay. You go earn $1,500. <clears throat> How much tax do you owe if you're in a one-third bracket? You owe 500 that only leaves you $1,000 for your landlord. If you pay $2,000 a month in rent, then you got to come up with another $1,000 a month for the government. The government wants one half of what you're going to pay and one third of what you're going to earn. So think about that hard because that is a, that's a very, very important piece of this puzzle. Or any renter who's paying a thousand, two thousand, three thousand dollars a month has to understand what his after tax position is while he's renting and what his after tax position would be if he owned the property. Well, we can make him own the property, give him uh, a full and complete t- title holding ownership in the property without having to put him on the title. We give him 100% of the fee simple ownership. He doesn't have to qualify for a loan. He doesn't have to come up with a down payment. He doesn't have to fill out a credit application. All he's got to do is is fog up a mirror and pay you a couple thousand for doing it for him. You put him into that property with a little bit of positive cash flow. You just made some money without having to go through getting a new loan or a down payment or anything else. And so did he. Let's say you got a $200,000 house, there's a $230,000 loan on it. How does that change anything from what I just said? $30,000 uh, uh, over encumbered. 
So you come in and you say, okay, the, the mutual grade value on this property is 230000 So anything over 230000 is yours. Anything under 230000 will go to the settlor, the person who has the property, the, the non-resident beneficiary. Now, the guy says, well, yeah, but why would I want to buy a house for 30000 more than it's worth? Well, you're not doing that. You're buying a house in the future. In other words, you're going to live in it and pay the, the money today and tomorrow. But when you buy the house, you're assuming <clears throat> that it's going to be worth a lot more than 230000 But when you do buy it, all you have to pay is 230000 So if it goes up 100000 over the next five years, which it probably will, and you and you sell it for a hundred thousand dollars profit. That means instead of a hundred thousand, you're only making seventy thousand. Now go back and calculate your after-tax rental cost and see how much money you saved, thousands of dollars over and above what you would have paid out if you'd have been renting the same house for the same period of time with no equity, no appreciation, no tax write-off. And no no ownership, no pride of ownership. Obviously, anyone who would acquire a house that way is going to be far better off. Give me a house to, to, today. Give me a house that's worth uh, 300000 That's And there's a loan on of three hundred and fifty. Watch how fast I take that property. And watch how fast I put somebody else in it who thinks like I do, who doesn't care about the over encumbrance. What they care about is how beautiful the neighborhood is and how delightsome the other neighbors are, and how beautiful the house is, and how close it is to their kids' schools, and how much the payments are. They're going to look at it and say, well, yeah, since the property is over encumbered, my gosh, well, the guy's paying on a loan that's higher than the value of the house. That's true. So what? How much do you want the payment to be? What if I can get this house for you that's worth three hundred? With a $350,000 loan on it, but your payments are going to be based on what you would pay if you got a loan for 100% financing on a $300,000 house. Would that be okay? Yeah, sure, that'd be fine. That'd be 100% financing. Yeah, but you got a $30,000 three-payment penalty there, free prepayment penalty. Oh, that's okay. It won't be for five years, and yeah, that's fine. Well, that's all you're doing. You call the over encumbrance a prepayment penalty and, you know, let them know that it goes down a little bit every month, every time you make a payment. And by the time you get to the end of your contract, five years, six, whatever it is, the over encumbrance will be cannibalized and it'll be gone. And whatever you sell the property for over and above its then value will be pure profit to you. Now, I know that. When we do these calls, that I have to talk faster than I normally would. And on a day like today, you got me with a, uh, um, a rattly voice. And I don't know where that's coming from. It might be because I've been on my back in bed for, what, five days now. Uh, and, but I'm up and, and rambunctious today. I'm going to go play football a little bit. No, I'm not. <laughs> I almost lied to you there for a second. So uh, things are good. But that's what I want you to see. I don't, I'm not trying to say to anybody that you should go out right now and let's see, how would I phrase this so that it doesn't sound like the exact opposite of what I'm trying to tell you. Over encumbered properties are not something that you necessarily have to go out and look for. When you're looking for property of any kind, Shut up, lady. If you're looking for property of any kind, you're going to find the over-encumbered properties. All I'm telling you is when you find an over-encumbered property, you got two choices. You can walk away or not walk away. And I'm saying don't walk away. If you don't want to take it, call me immediately. I'll take it. But I, Or I'll show you how to take it and how you can make some money. Because if you've got somebody else paying the payments... Somebody else making the, the covering the management costs, and somebody else handling all of the maintenance and repair and the upkeep, and you've got a positive cash flow of a hundred to two hundred dollars a month or more coming in, and the guy paid you ten thousand for the privilege of you finding him a beautiful place to live that he could afford, and the seller paid you ten thousand to to get this big monkey off his back. What do you care if the property is over encumbered or not? You got ten thousand from the seller, ten thousand from the buyer, a couple hundred dollars a month positive cash flow. 
I've just, and, and you don't have to do, you don't have to lift your finger to do any work. And if the, if the buyer doesn't pay, you've got a contingency fund already established that the payment gets made out of while you're looking to replace that defaulting party with another person with another 10000 for you. So why does an over-encumbered property get in somebody's way? And what if you're the guy in your area, which most of you are going to be, who knows how to do this? How many other people are out there dying to find over-encumbered properties? How many people know that millions of people right now would be happy to move into an over-encumbered property. They just got foreclosed on on one that they owned, got kicked out into the street, and they'd love to get back into something of the equivalent value and equivalent appearance and so forth. They're not concerned about the over-encumbrance. They're concerned about whether or not it's beautiful and whether or not they can afford the payments and whether or not there's a chance that the house will be worth more in the future than it is today. So when we do these things, when we do these presentations, I'm always, always amazed at how few people are not in the middle of, a, of their first transaction or their second or third within two days. Doesn't make sense to me. I, I call people on a regular basis. I'm not calling enough because I've got so many things going on right now that I'm not calling often enough to get properties, but that changes. Uh, either today or tomorrow when I'm able to walk without a screaming fit going on. Um, so there's no reason not to. You know, I, I'm sitting here just looking out my window, looking around the Las Vegas area. We're in Henderson, but looking around, just thinking of how many of those rooftops that I see are available. If somebody ever knocked on the door and said, hey, I know you're over encumbered. I know you're upside down and I don't care if your swimming pool is all uh, black and covered with fungus and I, I don't care if there's plaster missing off the wall and I don't, or the grass is up to the window. I don't care. I'll take it off your hands. Then you sit down and you start talking about what the values of the property really is, what it's going to be and how much repair work it's going to take, whether you're going to spend a dime or not. You still got to let them presume that you will, how much repair work it's going to take and all of that kind of stuff and how much is owed on it. Find out what the deficiency is. And then when you find out if this thing is upside down, you've given them all of this wonderful news. I'll take the property and da, da, da. And then as soon as you hear that it's upside down, you go like this. Okay, well, when you go, that means, oh, crap, <laughs> now we got a problem. And they're thinking, oh, well, you had me now. Now you're scaring me. I thought I was going to be able to get out, get out from under this thing. But now you're going, and that worries me. But that, that little symbol that you just used there, the little signal that you just used, what that says is that you're ready to tell them the bad news. The bad news is I can still do it, just exactly as I said I would, but since the payment is too high because of that over encumbrance, here's what we can do. I can put my partner in the property for 100% of its actual value, calculate the payments at a high interest rate, maybe 5 or 6%, calculate the payments that are fair to them for a property of that value, and then anything over that amount, after they calculated the, the principal interest taxes and insurance, the PITI, anything over that amount, you can pay. And then you wait and see what they do with their eyeballs. If their eyeballs blink, then you might need to come up with something else. If they don't blink, keep right on talking. Because what they would be able to do, if they're, if they're upside down every month now, because there's nobody living in the house that's vacant, the bank is banging on them and they can't do anything, and they're, they're laying out 2000 or $2,500 a month every single month, and you come back and say, well, we can reduce that outgo down to 400 a month. How would that be? Well, that would be great. And then what you can do is to say, well, I'll tell you what, we can do that on a $400 a month basis for a period of five years. Or if you want, let me have 10000 up front, and we'll subtract that from the 400 due for the next five years. How much would that be? Sixty, four hundred. that'd be four twelve. dollars What's that? $12,000, 400 for 60 months? Ah, say 10 would be 4,000, and six times 10 ought to be $24,000. 
So give me half of the 24,000 today and the other 12,000, uh, the other half. <laughs> My brain's really working good. And the other half on a monthly basis over a period of time. So you can see that if you just think and plan, there's a lot of profit centers in there. You don't, and the only reason I'm so, so high on the, the concept of dealing in over encumbered properties is not to get an army of people going out there and looking for over encumbered properties. The only reason I do that is because we have the solution for the over encumbered properties. We have the solution of how we can use that, those 400, uh, uh, that, those over encumbered properties to our benefit and put money in our pocket because of them and because of the mistakes that the government has made. The government really screwed up. I mean, they got seven, seven $17 trillion in national debt and only $16 trillion in national income, and that's going up a billion dollars or two every six months. So right now... <clears throat> We're in a, a, an unusual position. We're in a position that can really make us some money. Let me show you something. And some of you may have seen this already before, but I want to show it to you again. Hold on just for one second here. Oops, that's not what I wanted to show you. Yeah, okay, I'll show you desktop. All right, here's what I wanted to show you. Do -do, do -do, do -do. All right. <clears throat> I'm presuming you can see my screen right now. It's, it's, this is a very short presentation. Some of you have already seen it, but it's only a couple slides. So here's some comforting facts. The national unemployment rate is now 8.2%. In California, the rate is 10%, the highest in the country. Nevada is 9.5%, down a little from 9.6%. California has gone up a little bit, but the national has gone down to about 8% from 8.2%. Now, here's some few facts which are working in our favor relative to this government mess. Most Americans have less than $25,000 to retire on. Not good. 34% of Americans have no savings at all. Not good for them, anyway. 58% have no retirement plan of any kind. Not good for them. 40% of Americans don't even know what the terms mean, annuity or mutual funds. 20% of Americans are thinking and planning that they can live on Social Security, and the government may need to take that away pretty soon. Government doesn't like paying Social Security. We're, we're breaking them, and there may not be any left for our children and our grandchildren, or there might not be any left for us, for that matter. So none of these folks can play in our game. They can't buy a home anymore. Okay? So think about this for a second. The U.S. per capita income, like I said, $13.5 trillion. That's $13.5 trillion divided by 314 million people. And the median income is $50,000. That's where that number comes from. So the gross national product today in the United States, $16 trillion. And the, and the national debt is $17 trillion. And if you think you know how much a trillion dollars is, does that seem like much? Seven, you know, we're only upside down by $1 trillion. My goodness. If we take everybody's money out of everybody's bank in the entire United States and nobody takes a salary for a year, not a single one of the 314 million people takes a salary, is paid for anything, and a hundred percent of that money goes to the government, we're still a billion dollars in arrears. I'm going to show you something here that's going to blow your socks off. So the average American realtor's annual income is about fifteen thousand dollars because most realtors are not selling anything and they think they're working part time and so on. But the average real estate investor, you and me, makes sixty five thousand dollars a year. So here's a question for you. Think about this. Picture in your mind a 14, uh, 4,000 cubic foot capacity, 53 foot long semi truck or trailer. And think about how full it would be if it was loaded with a trillion dollars. 
in $100 bills. Not dollar bills. $100 bills. How full would it be? Would it be three-fourths full, completely full, all the way to the ceiling? Or might we need another truck? I'm going to take a cup of co- a sip of coffee here while you're thinking about that. And here's the answer for you. Hundred dollar bills, okay, stacked up, loaded into a 53 foot semi truck trailer. Here's a, here's how big a one hundred dollar bill is. One hundred dollar bill. Here's a stack of one hundred dollar bills of ten thousand dollars. Here is a ten thousand dollars, one hundred one hundred dollar bills. And now, keep your eye on this guy. He, he becomes important here in just a second. Here's a million dollars. It's only that little stack of these. Okay, it's a hundred of these right here. It's two rows of of 50 and so forth. That's one million dollars. Now take a look at this. Here's a hundred million dollars. That's a three and a half foot cube of of hundies. Now notice it comes up to just about his solar plexus there. Okay. Now here's a couple rows of one billion dollars. So it takes 10 of these stacks, cubes, to make a billion dollars. So now start thinking about how much room you would need in that truck for a trillion dollars. There it is. There's the guy over there to the left. And we got two two levels here of those cubes. Remember, here's the cubes. So now we're going to stack one cube on top of the other all the way through. And I haven't counted them. It's about 50-some. Uh, there's 100 stacks in a row and 100 stacks in a column, I think. Right about that. So if you try to count these all the way back, I think it comes up to 53 across the front and 65 lengthwise or something. That's a trillion dollars. Now, how, much, how, <laughs> how full is that truck going to be? There's your truck, okay, and there's a trillion dollars. Now, that's how far we are behind, even, I mean, that's ridiculous. We're 17 trillion dollars behind. Uh, we're not one trillion dollars behind anything. If we tried to pay off uh, China and Japan and the Netherlands and everything else, we'd be out of luck. I mean, we couldn't even do it with a truckload, it wouldn't be any, or, or with uh, 50 truckloads, wouldn't do it. So, $17 trillion, and if you look behind the letters, there's a trillion dollars 17 times, and here's a whole bunch of trucks lined up, and that's what you get. I mean, it's just uh, staggering. Now, when you understand this, you need to understand how that affects you and me. And the way it affects you and me is this. We understand that, but we've got to step aside. Let that happen. Who cares? I don't care. Um, you know, I'm old enough now that I'll probably be dead before the, the United States blows up, if it ever does. I don't think it ever will, but I don't care. But your kids care and your grandkids care. So let's start building something for them today. Let's start getting houses and houses and houses because houses are like gold. The economy goes one way. Real estate uh Market goes with it usually, but anyone who understands the gold market realizes what happens when any commodity is depressed for any period of time. It's like p- compressing a, a water or a, a sponge bed. You can compress it down to the point where you can suck all the air out and stick it in a shoebox and then open it up later on and it'll spring back to a full king size bed for you. Well, that's kind of the way the economy is. No matter what happens in the economy, The commodity market shrinks, and by commodities, I'm loosely referring to real estate, too. I'm referring to any commodity that we want to own for any reason. So I'm not worried about it because I'm going to have, you know, maybe, uh, I don't know, about a truckload of these, but I'm going to have a couple of those stacks here uh, by the time uh, everyone else is screaming about the problems. So let's get back to business here for a second. So, stop sh- Okay, I will. So, the deal is, don't sit on your ass. Please, guys, 
I don't mean that for the girls. Girls, don't sit on your, your cute tushies and do nothing when you don't have to do that. There are too many opportunities. It doesn't cost you any money to get rich. It doesn't cost anything to get rich. You don't have to pay for houses. If somebody wants you to pay for a house, go get another house. There's too many free houses out there right now. The problem that people have is a couple. Doubt. They doubt that what I'm saying is true. They doubt that after they understand that what I'm saying is true, they doubt their ability to comprehend clearly enough to do what I say you can. And then their family sits in on them and their best friends sit, sit in on them. Their brother-in-law, who's a realtor and knows everything, sits in on them. And the attorneys around town sit in on them. They tell them it can't be done, can't happen. You're just going to get yourself in trouble. Well, I'm going to guarantee you guys you can't get yourself in trouble, not with our program. And the reason for that is that our program is set up so that you can't. I've been named in lawsuits. Our company's been named in lawsuits. And we wanted to be. But we've never lost one. You know, we've been in business for over 25 years, and we've been sued in state court and federal court, or not sued us, but we've been a part of lawsuits in state courts and federal courts. And I'm not even an attorney, much less ugly. Uh, and I've got, whatever that means, and I've gone in and won these cases because we are so tight and so so well organized in what we do. When somebody owns a property, and they put it into a trust, a, a land trust. They don't own it anymore. But they have 100% of all the benefits of owning it. They don't have to own it to have all the benefits of own it, owning it. Um, who was it? Uh, uh, John Rockefeller said, you know, the secret to being really, really wealthy is to own nothing and control everything. Now, think about that. Now, I don't own anything, but I control a lot. And I don't have to own anything to be wealthy. You don't own a car when you're leasing a car, but when you go driving down the street in a brand new Cadillac or a, a Lexus or something, people look at you and go, Ooh, that was a rich guy. No, not a rich guy. He's leasing the car from somebody else. They own it. He doesn't. He doesn't have to own that car to be rich. He leased it, and all the money that he would otherwise have spent for a down payment, he went on a, a, a European cruise five times. So control everything. Own, not, own as little as you can get by with not having to own, and that's it. I want to ask if my buddy is on the line right now, Mr. Ehlers. Hang on. Whoops, I undid the wrong ding-dong. Uh, hang on, that's not the one I wanted. Hold on, Brett. I'm coming to you. Uh, if you're there. Oh, here you are. You're right up on top. I think. Okay, I... Brett, you keep jumping around on me here. All right, we're going to try again. <sighs> gotcha. Brett, how are you doing this morning? I am doing terrific, thank you. How are you? Good. I made you the presenter, so I'm all ears. Tell me, before we get rolling on something else, if you could fill any in any of the blanks of my presentation this morning, I'd appreciate it, because I just have a feeling that I didn't have the the right jewel, the the one diamond that is going to kick everybody over the edge into the money pot. I would like to discuss don't water landlords for a minute, if that's okay. Absolutely. Okay. Uh, one of the things that has really come to the surface in the last few months is people that ended up by default renting out their properties and this includes the great big hedge funds and they're finding out that being a landlord isn't very exciting and can be rather miserable if they do not know what they're doing and most of the people that ended up putting renters into their properties they didn't know what they were doing uh, we're finding a lot of the properties where they're on the market and when the network members interview these people and they say, well, 
I'd like to, uh, the way that I'd buy your property is we'd have an arrangement where your financing would stay in place. The people will generally come back and say, no, I want cash for my property. The next question that I ask them is this. How long have you had the property as a rental? And many of them have had it for seven, eight, nine, ten years in some cases because they haven't been able to get rid of the property. It's been over encumbered and now they're attempting or hoping that they'll be able to get it sold. If their tax professional has been doing what they're supposed to, that means that they've got several years of depreciation and that they're going to have to pay back at the closing costs or at the closing table over and above taking care of the obligations on the property. I ask the individual and 99% of the time the answer to this question is no I haven't done that. The question that I ask is have you spoken with your tax professional so that you know the hit you're going to take for cash at the title company when you close this property. And 99% of them say, well, no, I, I haven't talked with them. I say, well, more than likely, you're going to have to come up with tens of thousands of dollars to pay back the government on this property because it has been a rental. And so the first thing that we need to do here to, to protect your interest is I'd like for you to discuss with your tax professional how much you're going to have to come up with at the closing table to get rid of this property and then let's make an appointment so that we can talk about purchasing the property. When I come back to them and they've had the conversation with their tax professional, it isn't very happy for them and now what we're presenting with leaving their financing in place is a whole different story that they are open to because typically they do not have the money to be able to get rid of that property. They also are tired of not, uh, they are tired of being the landlord, they're tired of doing the management on the property and with your system bill we don't have to worry about any of those things that these don't want or landlords have been working with. Also there are properties that have a little bit of equity in them uh, not a lot. Of course, everybody wants more for the property than it's really worth, and, and you show, would show that over and over and over and over again at the workshops. The biggest, uh, it, the, the, uh, two of the biggest questions that I ask that bring, and I'm a lot more aggressive than you are, Bill. Bill, you're nicer than I am. You like uh, uh, giving more money to the seller. Uh, than I do. Uh, so the two questions that I'm going to ask the individual when I'm speaking with them is do you ha have you paid for a certified bank appraisal for your asking price? And in a matter of about 60 to 120 seconds I'm going to have that price reduced down to what they owe on the property in order for them to sell it. So when I ask the question, have you paid for a certified bank appraisal for the asking price, they'll say, oh, well, no, we just kind of think it's worth that. Of course, they're basing it off of a house that's sold down the street that's twice as large, uh, that's 20 years newer, and is in a lot better condition. But their gem is, is equally worth that amount of money. So the next question that I ask them is, well, Bob, you know that in order to get this property financed, it's going to have to pass an FHA inspection, and it's also going to have to pass an FHA appraisal. So let me ask, when FHA comes out and appraises your property in its current condition, what do you really think the home is going to appraise for? I'll get anywhere from ten to $50,000 less than what they're asking when we got started in the conversation. And so that's just a couple of little tricks uh, that uh, I use. The big one right now though is going after all of those don't water landlords. All they have to do is look in the 
uh, in the classifieds, the electronic classifieds, under rentals, find the properties that are not being represented by a management company or a real estate agent, and start calling the people. Hey, I just like you teach, Bill. I saw the uh, the for rent ad on Craigslist or U Pillar or wherever they saw it. I was wondering if the property is also for sale. And it's a great, great time to be getting engaged in those properties and uh, setting them up with the equity holdings system. I, I see your lips moving, Bill, but I'm not hearing... Yeah, that! <laughs> no, we still don't have any sound. Yeah, no sound. I don't know why. No, still no sound. How about now? Yeah, there we go. Oh my gosh, I haven't had any sound that whole time. Yeah, for uh, it, it's as soon as you started speaking, we we just got to watch the the they they call that a silent movie, I believe. You mean the slide presentation I just did was there was no sound? Oh, there was sound for that. We were good on that. Oh, okay, okay. Good. Just when you came uh, came back in here a minute ago. Okay, I had a another uh, kind of a, an analogy that I just just for a minute or so that I wanted to run off of what Brett just said. Understand, guys, when, when you're able to get on this call and you, you listen to me, I'm a hacker when it comes to doing what we do compared to Brett. Brett has bought more houses than I have. He, he's done every kind of real estate deal you can do. I remember that it was a couple of years ago. We went back to uh, to spend some time with Brett and Heidi, and he took me on a little drive. And everywhere we went was a piece of property that he owned or used to own or that his family owned or something. And I, I just was uber impressed <laughs> the guy really knows what he's talking about so if you get the, the data from me i honestly won't lie to you i won't tell you something that i don't think is absolutely perfectly true if you get the information from brett i'd take my baby's life on it so just know that you're getting some really good data here don't sit on it and let it waste here's what i want to show you just real quick you know we talk about some of these examples and here's one. Wait, am I doing this thing right? Hold on a second. I got to share. Okay, where are we? Let me run through here. Here's where I want to be. All right. <clears throat> Let's see if I do it this way. I go to, hold on, guys. Current slide. There we go. So take a look at that. Here, here's one of many examples of what we're trying to, to talk to you about today. Before I get into this slide, think about this for a second. Let's say that you've got a bunch of people lined up and they want to rent houses. They say, please find me something to rent and I can pay up to 1600 a month. And somebody else says, I can pay up to 1800 and somebody else says 2500 Somebody else says no more than 800 and so forth. But you've got these people lined up on a board on your wall waiting for you to find them income properties. Excuse me. Waiting for you to find them rental properties. All they want to do is rent a house. They don't care whether it's upside down, over encumbered, pink, blue, purple, or anything else. They just want to rent a house. So now you say, okay, I want to go out and find some rental houses that I can put these people in because I love them all. Where would be a better place to look than in areas where the properties have been foreclosed on, the people are sick to death of owning the property. They can't sell it. They can't do anything. They're trying to rent it out and uh, or not. And you come in and say, listen, I just need your house for five years for a rental. And what I'll do, if we can do that, is I'll make sure that you get a piece of whatever profit there is to have on the rental. And let's say you're going to give them 100 bucks a month just for them letting you rent it out. And pretty much handle it, okay? You want out more than a hundred bucks a month, but let's just say for that for now. How long would it take you to find people who would give you a house under those terms and conditions? You're just going to take their house and rent it up. They're going to put it in a trust so that it's protected from you 
against liens and suits and judgments, and then you're going to just rent it to your clients. Now, what happens now, since that house is in the trust for their own protection, you bring the client in and you make the client a co-beneficiary so that they can have the full income tax write-off. How many clients, rental clients, are not going to want to do that? They can rent for less money and get 100% of the income tax write-off. How many sellers, on the other hand, are not going to want to let somebody else take over the payments and the maintenance, the repair and the upkeep and the property tax and the insurance and the headaches and the tenants and toilets and trash, and it's not going to cost them anything? Think about that for a second. Think about that, but do something about that, too. Here we go. Here's one of many examples. Here's the house we're going to talk about worth $200,000. And, Brett, if I get to a point where I say something that doesn't sound logical or it isn't clear, let me know. Here's a loan on this property of $235,000. So we can see the house is $35,000 upside down. Now, the payments on that loan are $1,400 a month. And the insurance is $60 a month. The property tax is $240 a month, which brings us up to a PITI payment principal interest tax of insurance of 1700 Now, the, the owner of the property is willing to hand this over to you because you say you told him you don't care about the $30,000 uh, over encumbrance. Now, so he's going to give you $2,500 up front, which is a whole big lot less than you would pay a real estate agent. And you could charge a lot more, too. I'm just putting 2500 to make it easy. Uh, he's he's going to pay you 2500 for all, everything you can do for him. You're going to take over the maintenance and repair and the upkeep and the property tax and the insurance and everything else. And the buyer that you're going to bring in, he says, if I had money, I wouldn't mind making a down payment. But even if I made a down payment, I could only buy a $100,000 house if I made a 10% down payment. You say, well, that wouldn't do it. In today's economy, you're going to have to make a 20% down payment and have perfect credit. How about if I can get you this house here, this beautiful $200,000 home, for uh, 5% down? Oh, my God, yeah, that's a great thing. Yeah, you can do that. So he's going to come in, pay 10000 up front to get in. So all of a sudden, you've already got twenty five and ten. Total closing cost, $1,500, $2,000. That leaves you with 10000 bucks to put in your pocket. Your guy moves in. He's going to take over all the payments. You don't. You're not going to make the payments. He's going to handle all the upkeep and repairs. You're not. So his monthly payment now is going to be fifteen sixty five a month. Uh, and the seller now, you're going to ask him to contribute three hundred a month because he knows that his payment is too high. Here's fifteen sixty five a month that this poor guy's making, and the seller knows his payment's only four hundred or fourteen hundred. So he knows that the payment is way too high. But you reduce his negative cash flow from $1,700 a month down to $300 a month. So he pays $300, the buyer pays $1,565, and you've got $10,000 up front. You've got uh, half, of, if a property goes up 5% a year uh, for five years, then the, the value is $255, and you're going to get uh, $25,000. Half of the the appreciation plus the upfront ten, so your total profit is thirty two five, not counting the positive cash flow that you're getting. Positive cash flow, oh, yes, sir, ten thousand dollars, one hundred eighty five dollars a month positive cash flow for five years, sixty months. That gives you ten thousand. You collected ten thousand upfront. Your half of the future appreciation is twenty five thousand. So you made thirty two thousand five hundred dollars on this deal. And how much did it cost you? Cost you anything? There was no down, no credit qualifying, no management, no maintenance fee, no threat of uh, in rem litigation, which means against the property. Property is completely protected from liens and suits and judgments and everything else. And um, you got a free property manager in every one of these properties that you pick up. They're they're busting their tail for you, and they're going to give you fifty percent of any profit there is to be made, and they're going to cover one hundred percent of all the payments. 100% of all the expenses and the headaches. Tell me. <laughs> Tell me what's wrong with that. Okay, don't tell me I shut my hickey off there again. Brett, are you still there? 
what I do. Okay, Brett, are you still there? There, yes, I'm here. Did anybody hear what I just said? With that yes, all of, all of that came through just perfectly. And oh. the numbers that you've got are, are exact. One of the things that untrained investors do when they buy an apartment building is they feel, or a, a not necessarily apartment building, but a single family is a rental or rental properties, is they fail to realize all of the expenses that are involved in the property uh, because they listen to the real estate agent that's never bought a lick of investment property in their life and is feeding them full of lies and misinformation, uh, not deliberately. So if there's anybody that's got their license here, I'm not trying to discourage uh, licensed agents. And I had my license for about 10 years. Uh, but here, here are the costs that are incurred, whether you do the management or whether you pay to do the management, there has to be, uh, you don't ever want to do the management for free if you're doing a traditional rental property. Well, with the equity holding trust system, as you said, the manager's in place. We don't have to worry about that expense. Uh, vacancy. They will, even if all you do is replace your tenants annually on the contract, your unit or your property is going to be down for at least 30 days every 12 months in order to get it ready for the next tenant. So they don't take into consideration the vacancy. On a property, uh, they don't take into consideration uh, about $100 a month in just repairs that are going to have to be made because of occupancy. You may get two or three months as a, as a traditional landlord that you don't have to pay anything, but then the water heater goes down or there's a problem with the furnace or something happens and so they don't, cons they don't have that fund of a hundred a month into their rents. Uh, common utilities, if they have uh, and, and I want to keep this in residential property, so a four-unit apartment, three, two, or a single family. Uh, if you've got uh, uh, two or more, you're going to have common, u unit, uh, common utilities. And more so back east, if you've got uh, a building, you're going to be paying for the utilities for the heat, for the oil to heat that, that property, so they don't consider that. And then also the water to run the property. Uh, and then you uh, brought the uh, insurance into play. Uh, and then just the maintenance of uh, mowing the lawn and, and keeping the property up. Well, all of these are expenses that traditional landlords find out that they're going to have to pay after the fact and then they're subsidizing the property. And when you show that these individuals have a $300 contribution to, to the property, it is so much less than they're already subsidizing on that property, it's not even funny. Sure. And now everything is taken care of because you have an on-site property manager living in the property. Brad, you're a smart guy. Let's make sure that our smarts get transferred to these people that are on the phone right now. We owe it to them. There are very few people on the phone who haven't already paid us a bunch, paid me at least a bunch of money to train them and teach them and so forth. And I don't want to take anyone's money who I can't train and teach and make rich. Now maybe all these people are rich and they don't need any more. Maybe maybe they're ready to be weaned off, but I don't think so. My my only concern in all of this, I'd like to have enough money to pay my bills. Maybe buy a hamburger every now and then. But my real true concern, and you know this about me, is when I see one of our students who got rich, either overnight or after two years of doubt and finally suddenly realizing that this is something they could have been doing all this time, that's what makes me happy. I, I have too much teacher in me. I, I, ma I minored in, in college in education. I majored in English and speech, minored in education and psychology. So... I've got a lot of teacher in me, and the real teacher is the teacher who says, the only thing I want out of this job is to know that I've taught 
these students something. I don't care about money. I just want to know that I'm doing a good job as a teacher. And that's something. If a teacher cared a lot about money, they certainly wouldn't be a teacher. It's the worst thing in the world you could do. And I guess I've inherited some of that because my concern in this business is hearing from people who say, thank you for making me rich. Thank you for the house I just bought. Or like Eloise Figueroa, thank you for being able to make a million, uh, what was it, a million two the first year we met. And so on. So that's what I want. And I want the people on the line right now to understand that. Please, 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 don't call to this number on Saturday unless you're going to use it now to go get yourself some big, big bucks. I've been rich and I've been poor. And rich is better. I mean, that's all <laughs> I can tell you. So, Amen. Brett, I didn't give you much time today, and I apologize for that, but I think it might be one of the best uh, um, best programs we've done so far. You you gave these folks a lot of information. So if you wouldn't mind taking about a minute or two uh, to tell them what to do about FES, I would appreciate it. Absolutely. One of the biggest components of the real estate business, especially right now, is being able to quickly pre-screen your buyers to make sure that you're working with uh, people that are serious, not just uh, pulling your chain and having you run around. Uh, we use FES and the credit restoration services for that very thing so that within uh, a matter of about eight minutes, we know if that potential resident beneficiary is legitimately an individual that we would be able to work with and someone that we'd be able to take through the process. So at the end of the trust transaction, they're going to be able to get their own financing and complete the transaction so that you get your big payday because you put the you you put the system in place and so if you're not taking advantage of that it's bigger now than it's ever been in all of the years that I've been buying real estate uh, that's been since 1980 and if you'll use the tools that are available to you with FES and with Bill and the Equity Holding Trust you're going to be able to have a huge business. I encourage you strongly, get involved with Bill. Uh, the uh, You'll want to have your own agency, and that agency includes all the services for you. If your credit is under 740, you're going to pay in the next 90 days more than it will, uh, than the investment will be as an agent. The investment is $286. $87 a month. If you have bad credit, you're going to pay more just on your auto insurance than if you had two speeding tickets. So we want to encourage you, get your scores up over 740, become an agent, utilize the buyer incubation system. Let's go get some real estate because now is prime time. Just got the stats in this morning and the market is at zero as far as movement of real estate people need to sell their properties just because of life events and now is the time to be engaged and putting those properties into trust get those properties to bill so we can set up the documentation for you and like bill says let's go make some money yeah you've got it Brett. thank you so much i really appreciate it. i'm gonna i'm gonna close out with a little story here today and i'm gonna it's going to have a, a punchline that some of you won't get until you think about it for a little while. It's like those jokes that uh, come out that it, it takes a little thought before they finally kicks in, like, you know, uh, the, uh, the uh, let's see, what were the toothless termite walks, a toothless termite walks into a beer joint and says, where's the bartender? Now, people are not going to get that for another 20 minutes in some cases. <laughs> But that's funny. That's just funnier now, right there. Okay, here we go. <laughs> that is good. That is good. So, see, the toothless termite walks into beer joint and says, where's the bartender? So, let me tell you the one that uh, maybe puts put some thought in some people's heads. Maybe not. The guy goes in, the lumberjack goes in um, to Sears Roebuck up in Portland. And he says, I want to get me a new saw. You know, I, I've been working on 
My saw keeps getting dull, and all I can do is cut down about two trees a day. And I, I got to get more than this. They don't pay me enough. I got to cut down more than two trees in a day. So the salesman says, "Well, here's a, uh, a beautiful little Gregson Stratton right here. Um, it's only, it's you know, it's uh, 15 horsepower, and I tell you, it, it'll do the job." And the guy says, "Well." You think I'd cut down more than two trees a day? And he said, oh, of course, yeah, give it a shot. So the guy goes ahead and he buys the thing, pays the money, goes out. And uh, two days later, he comes back and he's got this saw with him and he throws it down on the uh, on the floor in front of the stand. And he says, this damn thing don't work. I want my money back. And the guy said, well, what do you mean? What's wrong? He says, well, I used to be able to cut down two trees a day with my regular saw. This thing, this thing, took me all day long to cut down one tree. And I said, that's incredible. I can't imagine what could be wrong. So he picks it up, takes a hold of the handle, and he yanks the, uh, the starter handle. The <laughs> and the guy goes, hey, what's that sound? <laughs> so think about that, guys. <laughs> Your your new tool is not going to be any good if you don't know how to turn it on and make it work for you. <laughs> thanks, thanks a bunch. We'll see you next hey, time. Thanks, hey, Bill. Bill. Great. Yes, sir. We have a question. We got some flags up. Okay, wait a second. Thank you, Russ. Can't see your example. Unmute. Flags are up. Okay, let's see. You're making too much noise when Brett is speaking. Well, shut up. Okay. Uh, quit picking your teeth. Shut up again. Uh, that's why I turned the camera off. I realized that people were looking at me. Uh, <laughs> quit scratching your head. <laughs> okay. Thank you, Rusty. You didn't see me scratch my butt. That was that would have been even worse. Okay, let's see. We have any flags. We got Lloyd Wilson with a flag. Lloyd, I tried to get you last week. Wait, I just plugged you up again. Hold on. There we go. Lloyd, are you oh, there? You yes, I can. Well, good. Yeah, I, yeah. I don't know what happened. I I got it going now, so I, that's the only reason I've sent up the flag to, to see if it's working. So. Yeah, well, you, I saw your flag last week, last Saturday, but I couldn't get you. You apparently didn't, weren't hearing me. It, no, well, I'll... So you just so put you, up the flag to test your flag, then? That's right. Test my <laughs> mic. <laughs> Boy, it's always good to hear in front of me anyway. Uh, let's see. Who else? Did you have a question? Yeah, you just went through this example a while ago, and I couldn't see that at all. I can send it to you. If somebody didn't see that example and you want to, send me an email. I'll, I'll, um, I'll pack it up and email it to you. All right, thank you. You got Have it. A great one. Thanks, Roy. You take care. All right. Okay. Rusty, we got anybody else? Hey, hey, Bill. No, uh, uh, that would be it. Okay, cool. Hey, Bill. Yes, sir. Hey, Bill. It's Lloyd again. Yeah, Lloyd. Celebrate my 53rd wedding anniversary next week. 53rd? 53rd. Wow. Same oh, lady. God. Same grand lady. 53rd. She's in there cooking me some collard greens with hog joe. Son of a Ooh. gun. <laughs> <laughs> Let's see, I'm going to be celebrating my 50. 56. Let's see, the first one was 25, and this second one's been about 27, so whatever that comes out to. <laughs> uh, uh, congratulations, Loy. Yeah, congratulations, uh, Loy. That well, woman is, I tell you, you got a good deal. If she can put up with you for all these years, you got yourself a good woman. Hey, you don't have to say that. <laughs> I already know it. <laughs> <laughs> well, tell her I give her my best, too. You guys take care. All right, bye. Okay. James says, when are you going to be coming to Florida? I don't know, James. Get me set up with 100 people to talk to, and I'll come and give you all the money if, I, if we make any. But, yeah, I'm not doing a lot of uh, out, outside things right now. I would if somebody could assure me of a group of at least probably 75 to 100 people, then I'd be happy to pay airline fare and hotel rooms and foods and all that kind of stuff. Have you heard any additional benefits to creating a land trust and using a trustee in the state of Virginia? No. I know you're talking about the 
the uh, Hughes, Randy Hughes or something. And that's all bullshit. That's total bullshit. Virginia has got I don't want to, land trust legislation, but uh, the land trust concept in any state, as long as you have, uh, in Virginia, they need a, uh, a RICO clause like they do in uh, Florida. And also, uh, you know, I, I don't like Virginia for doing business of any kind. Virginia is one of the most ruthless uh, states in the country for litigation, especially on this RICO issue. If somebody accuses you of, of uh, RICO violation, they can stop your business, impound every single thing you have without any proof of anything, and impound the money that you would pay to an attorney to protect you from them. So I don't even like Virginia, uh, especially Virginia Wolf. <laughs> See, that, that sounds like what happened in uh, Germany, in Europe. Well, I'll tell you, I, I, I even hate to come in on it, but you're absolutely right, and I hate to see it happening, but progress is one thing, and sometimes it takes a path that maybe we're not all completely happy with, but it's still progress, I guess. Even if we end up living in caves and, and having to hit women on the head to be able to have sex, you know. I mean, there's something to said for, be said for that. Well, there's, there's good news out there. Yeah, except all the women have flat heads. <laughs> <laughs> all right, buddy. You guys take care. See you all next week. Thanks, Bill. You betcha. Bye-bye.